Okay, so we're picking up where we left off uh, on oxidative phosphorylation part one, and we were talking about the electron transport chain. And so here's the picture from your book showing you um, how the electrons are being carried throughout complex one, two, three, and four, and then finally picked up by oxygen as the final electron acceptor to create a water molecule. But as the electrons are transporting throughout the chain, they're also establishing this proton gradient of the hydrogen ions moving um, from the, the matrix into the inner mitochondrial space. And so that proton gradient that's established, um, that will drive the work of ATP synthase. So in other words, because those hydrogen ions have to pass back through uh, the ATP synthase, and so when they come back down their gradient, it also provides the energy for ATP synthase to work to um, phosphorylate ADP and an inorganic phosphate to generate ATP. So this process right here is called chemiosmosis, and that's what we're going to get into now. But let's first go ahead and summarize. So the close association of NADH and FADH2 with proteins makes oxidative phosphorylation possible. The proteins will guide the electrons so that they move in order from one enzyme complex to the next. And then the transfer of electrons is coupled to the uptake and release of hydrogen ions, as well as to the allosteric changes in energy converting protein pumps. So the net result of this process is the pumping of hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane, which will establish our proton gradient. And that, that establishment of a proton gradient has two consequences. One, it generates a pH gradient. So the pH is higher in the matrix than, matrix, matrix than it is in the cytoplasm. And the second thing is that it generates a voltage gradient or a membrane potential. Um, so together, the change in pH and the change in membrane potential will establish our electrochemical proton gradient. And that electrochemical proton gradient will exert what we call a proton motive force. And again, this is all the result of the hydrogen ion gradient. So now that brings us into part two of oxidative phosphorylation, which is chemiosmosis. So chemiosmosis is where the proton gradient, the hydrogen ion proton gradient, is what drives ATP synthesis, okay? So in chemiosmosis, we have a very important enzyme called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase will create a hydrophilic pathway across the inner mitochondrial membrane that allows the hydrogen ions to flow down their chemo electrochemical gradient. And then as those ions move down, they will drive the reaction between ADP and an inorganic phosphate to create ATP. This is a very highly conserved enzyme. It is very similar in the majority of, of um, eukaryotic organisms today. Okay, so here is a picture. I know it's a little blurry. It's kind of hard to see of ATP synthase um, as well as its ribbon model as well. So ATP synthase, it is a multi-subunit protein involved in what we call rotary catalysis, which I'm going to go over in just a second. Um, on the matrix side of ATP synthase, we have a very large kind of lollipop looking shaped structure with six different subunits and then we have an elongated arm that will hold the whole enzyme in place by tying it to a group of transmembrane proteins so to speak that forms what we call the stator okay s-t-a-t-o-r and that is going to be the motor part of the protein so this right here is your stator okay this right here is what we call the rotor this right here is the internal rod, and then this right here is what we call the catalytic knob, okay? So the stator is in contact, right here, this is your stator. The stator is in contact with a ring of 10 to 14 identical subunits, and that's what this is, okay? This is what, call, or this is what forms the stator rotor, so to speak, okay? So as the hydrogen ion protons move through the channel, their movement is what causes that rotor right here to spin. And then that will spin the rotator stock, and then that will ultimately spin the lollipop head, okay, or that, that catalytic knob. So three out of the six subunits in this lollipop head have binding sites to ADP and inorganic phosphate. 
Um, and so ATP synthase is very efficient, so to speak. I mean, it can produce about 100 ATP molecules per second, which is really neat. Okay, and then this is the uh, picture from your textbook, so this one probably looks very familiar. The flow of the protons back through the membrane-bound ATP synthase by chemiosmosis generates ATP from ADP and an inorganic phosphate. Okay, so again, here's your stator, the rotor, the channel for the hydrogen ions to move through, the internal rod, and then the catalytic knob that turns like a rotor. Okay, so um, ATP synthase uses the exergonic flow of hydrogen ions to drive phosphorylation of ATP. This is an example of chemiosmosis, which is the use of energy in the hydrogen ion gradient to drive cellular work. The hydrogen ion gradient is referred to as the proton mode of force, emphasizing its capacity to do work. Okay? And then as the hydrogen ions flow down their gradient, they cause the rotor to rotate, meaning spin, and then the spinning rod causes a conformational change. Well, actually, it causes the internal rod to spin, and then it causes a conformational change in the catalytic knob, which um, by causing that conformational change, it will activate it. Um, so it activates the catalytic sites where the ADP and the inorganic phosphate combine to form ATP. Okay, so here's our summary box of cell respiration. Um, the first part are the net products from oxidation of one molecule of glucose. So in the glycolysis, we take one molecule of glucose is our input, and then our output is two pyruvate, two NADHs, and two ATPs. Then in pyruvate dehydrogenase in the citric acid cycle within the matrix, um, in the first pyruvate dehydrogenase or actually pyruvate oxidation. Um, you have two pyruvates as your input and then your output is two acetyl-CoA's and two NADH's. And then from the citric acid cycle your inputs are two acetyl-CoA's and then your outputs are six NADH's, two FADH2's, and two GTP's. Okay, And then from oxidative phosphorylation um, your input then would be well, we have two NADHs from glycolysis, and then we have eight NADHs from the mitochondria, so your input would be 10 NADHs and two FADH2s. Um, and then our output would be roughly 32 to 34 ATP. Okay, and this is another summary slide showing you um, the respiration equation, right? We have C6H12O6 plus 6O2 yields 6 water plus 6 CO2 plus energy in the form of ATP. Okay, so what processes or what pathways in um, cell respiration use and what they produce, right? So glycolysis, the input of glycolysis is glucose, okay? And then the output of the citric acid cycle is your carbon dioxide and your energy. Um, whereas for the electron transport chain or the oxidative phosphorylation, your input would be oxygen and your output would be water. Okay, and then here's our overview diagram again. So we just went through oxidative phosphorylation, which is two parts, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. And we are almost done. So ATP energetic coupling and a high ATP versus ADP ratio in the cells. Uh, so this slide basically um, is telling you that cells, in order to survive, they need a really high ratio of ATP. Okay, because biosynthetic enzymes, they will often drive energetically unfavorable reactions by coupling them to energetically favorable ones, such as the hydrolysis of ATP. Okay. ATP drives most of our cellular processes, much like a battery runs a car, so to speak. So if the mitochondria activity is blocked, ATP levels will fall, just like a cell's battery might run down. Okay. So eventually then, energetically unfavorable reactions can no longer be driven, and so then therefore the cell would die, just like the battery would die or the car would die. Okay. And this is the example I put here was poison cyanide because that's actually how it works. So poison cyanide um, works by blocking the activity of the mitochondria and so therefore you can't produce any more ATP and so then therefore all of your cells uh, die and so then you die as well. So cells need a high ratio of ATP in order to survive. Okay.
Now accounting for ATP, so why are the numbers of ATP produced not exact? Meaning if we go back to this slide, why is it 26 or 28 kind of a thing? Um, so there's three reasons, okay? So one is the phosphorylation and the redox reactions are not directly coupled to each other, so the ratio of NADH molecules to ATP is not a whole number, okay? So we know that 10 hydrogen ions must be transported out across the intermitochondrial membrane, but we don't necessarily know how many are needed to re-enter via ATP synthase in order to make one ATP. Um, but we think, after a lot of deliberation, we think it's about four hydrogen ions. So therefore, one NADH would generate enough proton motive force to make 2.5 ATPs, okay? But the citric acid cycle also supplies electrons via FADH2 as well, but those electrons enter, as we saw later in the chain. So they would provide um, enough hydrogen ions to support or let me back up, enough hydrogen ions are transported um, to provide energy for only about 1.5 ATPs, okay? Then the second thing here is that ATP yield varies slightly on the type of the electron shuttle used to carry electrons from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. So remember, the inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to NADH from glycolysis in the very beginning. So therefore, I mean, I'm talking about, whoops, whoops, right here. This one right here. So the inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to that, okay? Whoops. Um, so therefore, the electrons have to be shuttled across, okay? So if the electrons are passed to NADH, which is usually in uh, like a liver cell or a heart cell or something like that, then we would produce about 2.5 ATPs. But if the electrons are passed to FADH2, such as in a brain cell, then they would make about 1.5 ATPs, okay? And then the third reason is that the ATP yield can be reduced by the use of the proton motive force generated by redox reactions of respiration to drive other kinds of work, okay? So not just the synthesis of ATP. So in other words, the proton motive force can also be used to drive other processes such as active membrane transport, you know, like in order to, to transport pyruvate across the membrane from the cytoplasm um, to be oxidized. So we technically could generate more ATP if the proton motive force was solely focused on just driving ATP synthesis, but it's not. Okay, and... So cell respiration is a very efficient process in energy conversion, and in this case, we refer to efficiency as the percentage of chemical energy in glucose that is transferred to ATP. So complete oxidation of one molecule of glucose is 686 kilocals under standard conditions, and phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP stores 7.3. So therefore, the efficiency of respiration would be 7.3 kilocals times about 32 moles of ATP produced divided by the energy per mole of one glucose, right? So 686, and that leaves us with, with 0.34. So in other words, about 34% of the potential chemical energy from glucose is transferred to ATP. And obviously that percentage varies, okay, depending on the conditions. Um, but the rest of the energy stored in glucose is lost as heat. So for us, that would be like maintaining our homeostatic body temperature, okay? So maybe sweating and things like that. Um, but in comparison, you might not think that that's very good, but in comparison, the most efficient car today converts only about 25% of the energy that's stored in gasoline to energy to actually move the car. And then the rest of that is lost as heat. So in comparison to that, um, our cells are pretty cool. Okay, and then the last thing here is um, sometimes it can be advantageous to make less ATP, and that comes in the case of thermal regulation by mammals that are going to hibernation, right? Because they have to sleep for a long time, they have to have a way to store their energy even though the temperatures are really cold. So decoupling oxidative phosphorylation from the electron transport is involved in thermal regulation. So hibernating mammals have a type of tissue called brown fat that are very high in mitochondria, and they also have an uncoupling protein in their electron transport chain. This protein is activated during hibernation, and it allows protons to flow back down their gradient without actually making ATP. 
and it's an ongoing oxidation of stored fuel, generates the heat to keep the body temperature warm during their environment. So if ATP were made, it